Hello everyone, my name is uh, Bernard de Bruyne from uh, Alst in Belgium and it's my pleasure to chair one of the modules of this uh, series of uh, webinars dedicated to coronary uh, physiology in the cathedral library. This module is uh, devoted to invasive coronary physiology to assess specific entities uh, that we are very often confronted with, namely left main disease, aortic stenosis patients, and patients in whom CABG has been performed or is considered. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, helped in, during this webinar by uh, three outstanding speakers, namely uh, Dr. Gonzalo, Nieves Gonzalo from Madrid in Spain, Dr. Emanuele Barbato, my colleague from Alst here in Belgium, and Nicolas Mainvaux from Besançon, France. Thank you guys for uh, the lectures that you prepared on the topics. I will go to the next slide. The classical learning, learning objectives are, of course, to understand the basics of uh, physiology and fractional floor reserve in specific disease settings, as I already mentioned, but also to review the evidence. And I put that between quotation marks because there are actually more uncertainties than evidence when applying coronary physiology in these specific clinical settings. We will try also to understand how coronary physiology support decision-making in these specific clinical subsets. Now, why did we choose these uh, subsets, CABG, aortic stenosis, left main patients? Because we believe that in contrast to the, I would say the average patients with plain one or two vessel coronary artery disease uh, with very often, uh, let's say, intermediate stenosis, we are dealing with sicker patients with, let's say, in whom there are actually no other reliable non-invasive tests which are available to obtain real reliable information about the severity of, the, of these uh, lesions, the coronary lesions. The physiological background is also more complex. There are obviously fewer data, very few randomized data, and in these sicker patients, the clinical decisions that we have to take is really more important very often. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Emanuele Barbato, who will discuss coronary physiology in the setting of coronary artery bypass surgery. Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Bernard, for the kind introduction. Um, trying to advance with the slides. There we go. Uh, before deep diving into the first bit of the uh, webinar, I'd like to start posing the following question to our colleagues uh, connected uh, by remote. Um, also to understand more or less what you think about this topic. Do you ever measure fractional floor reserve in coronary artery disease patients candidate to bypass surgery? And I offer to your consideration the following option. Never. Just be honest, be blunt. If you do that, never, just say it. Uh, because you think, for example, that after all, cardiac surgeons will bypass all vessels. This is just one argument. You might have others not to do invasive physiology in these patients. Option B, you sometimes do that, but only in case of intermediate stenosis. And option C, you do that systematically to assess functional severity of all angiographic stenosis and confirm indication to bypass surgery. So while you take the time to address this question uh, and these uh, options, there will be a poll in the chat box. Please use that. And Bernard will collect your feedback and share it with all of us later on during my presentation. When approaching this topic, one of the first questions um, we should ask ourselves, actually, is whether it matters at all to have an accurate assessment of the stenosis severity uh, in patients that will be anyhow uh, be treated with uh, myocardial, with a surgical revascularization. Why do I pose this uh, first issue? Because we hear sometimes uh, saying that having a bypass on a stenosis coronary artery, whether the stenosis is tight or mild, doesn't really make a difference. Uh, you know, it's always better to have one bypass more than one bypass less. So starting with this background, I'd like to share with you this historical uh, data published already back in uh, 1998, 
showing that when you anastomose a native a stenotic native coronary artery, the chance of having atherosclerosis progression there is much higher as compared to surgical patients on vessels that were not initially bypassed. That holds true, not just for arterial grafts, but even more for venous grafts. You know, if a native coronary artery stenosis is bypassed with a venous graft, you can anticipate that the atherosclerotic progression on that native vessel will be more accelerated as compared to native coronary artery stenosis vessel being bypassed with arterial grafts. On the other side, what happens on the vascular conduit? What we know from this uh, uh, study published back in 2004 by uh, Bernard de Brin, first author of this paper was Alexander Berger, is that there is a, an interaction between the stenosis severity in the native coronary artery and the uh, patency rate in the internal mammary artery graft. And what you see in this slide is that the lower the diameter stenosis severity in the native coronary artery, the higher the chance that that arterial graft will occlude with uh, you know, uh, an odds ratio of 21.5. So it's not negligible. How does it uh, go with venous graft? Well, more or less the same message here. Look at the, uh, uh, at the bar that is highlighted by the yellow uh, arrow. If you anastomose a venous vein graft on a native coronary artery that has less than 75% diameter stenosis, the chance that this venous graft will occlude is much higher as compared to native coronary artery uh, stenosed vessels that were bypassed with uh, SVG, but in case of more than some more tighter stenosis, let's put it like this. Once we uh, understand that it is important to assess the severity of the native coronary artery uh, stenosis, then the next question is whether it matters to assess this stenosis severity by invasive functional assessment as compared to angiographic assessment. We know that that is the case for percutaneous coronary intervention, but is that the case also for patients candidate to bypass surgery? The first evidences in this direction came actually from the group of Nico Pels. Botman is the first author of this nice paper published in a surgical journal in 2007, showing that actually the lower the uh, uh, functional severity as assessed by FFR in the native coronary artery, the higher the chance that this graft will remain uh, patent, or the lower the chance that this graft will occlude, stated in another way. In fact, the failure of the grafts at one year implanted on arteries with no significant, significant FFR was three times higher. We confirmed this data with a longer follow-up in our data set. These are data coming from ALS, published in 2013. Gabor Todt was the first author of this paper. In uh, nearly 200 patients treated with FFR-guided surgical revascularization, meaning with that that the surgeons would bypass a native stenotic uh, artery if the FFR was below 0.8, would defer this, art, this revascularization if FFR was above 0.8, and compared this with a, a, a contemporary matched patient population of 429 patients. These patients were similar in terms of angiographic stenosis severity and rate of multivessel disease at the baseline. After having implemented invasive functional assessment, what we noticed it was a significant downgrading in the rate of multivessel disease from 95 to 86 percent. These had very practical implications in the sense that the rate of multiple bypass graft was significantly reduced from 40 percent down to 23 percent in the bottom line, and the rate of single anastomosis increased from 10 percent up to 20 percent. Off pump surgery uh, was also significantly increased in this patient. Despite patients in the FFR guided group received less bypass uh, anastomosis, so Translating this uh, in, let's say, incomplete anatomical revascularization, these patients did not experience any excess in terms of clinical endpoints up to three years, as suggested by overlapping Kaplan-Meier curves for MACE, TBR, MI, and overall survival. And these patients were even better from a, a symptoms point of view. Up to three years, you see that CCS class two to four angina was significantly lower 
in the patients belonging to the FFR guided group cohort. We also assessed in a subgroup of patients the graph patency up to three years, confirming the data shown already by the group of uh, Nicopels at one year of a superior graph patency rate in the FFR guided group. Yet, what we were not able to see at three years was the translation of this superiority in graph patency in terms of clinical endpoints. And as a matter of fact, we had to wait a six years follow up, so a much longer one, to see a benefit in terms of angiographic uh, uh, patency rate of the graphs translated into clinical outcomes. So better at composite endpoint of death and MI in the FFR guided group as compared to the angio guided group. So to summarize this first set of data, I can resume by saying that FFR guided uh, coverage is associated with lower number of graphs, high rate of off pump surgery, better functional class. This, despite the lower number of graphs, there is no excess in events after FFR guided coverage. Please consider this uh, statement. These are data coming so far from observational and retrospective uh, uh, data. With this, I'd like to quickly hand over back to you, Bernard, to see whether we have any feedback from our colleagues or any burning questions before I move on. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. This, uh, after this first part, I would like, and maybe we, can we project the numbers of the, of the poll? No, I don't think it's possible. But anyhow, I have, a, I have the poll uh, data in front of me. The question was, do you ever measure fractional floor reserve uh, in patients candidate for CABG? Never, sometimes, and systematically. Well, not a big surprise. Never is 19%. So some people are very uh, honest. Never. Systematically is 1%. So there is really a champion of uh, fractional floor reserve in physiology in patients candidate for CABG, and the vast majority, 80% plus, is uh, sometimes. I have no view on the numbers of the absolute numbers of voters, but these are the proportions. And this seems to me very, um, let's say, expected. Uh, you agree with that, uh, Emmanuel? Yes, I, I agree with that. And, uh, and after this goes hand in hand with, uh, with uh, the premise you made at the beginning of this webinar, actually, we have very limited data available. And as highlighted in this first part of my presentation, these are mostly derived by single center registries. But we'll see in the second part that uh, there are some randomized data also available. I don't know if there is any other uh, burning questions at this stage or any interventions from Nieves and Nicolas before I move on. Uh, well, there are no burning questions from the chat so far. Um, I, I would suggest you to go on, uh, Emanuele. Okay, then we go back to the slide. And I'd like to start this second set of uh, uh, the second part of my presentation by posing a second question to our colleagues. Now, try to put yourself in the shoes of a cardiac surgeon. I know that it's not the easiest thing to do, being an interventional cardiologist, but please try your best effort. And the question I would like to pose to you is the following. Does invasive functional assessment have any role at the heart team discussion? Well, option A, never. Cardiac surgeons are happy with the non-invasive testing available and with the coronary angiogram. So basically, the job is done once the coronary angiogram has been acquired. Option B, my cardiac surgeon requests at times a junctive FFR before deciding or planning coronary bypass surgery. Option C, I never present the case to the heart team without a junctive invasive functional assessment of intermediate stenosis. And I'll be happy to share my own option after this second part of my presentation. But please use the chat box to provide your feedback again. While you do so, I tell you that there is some randomized data available, not strong data, I have to be honest with you, but yet we try to summarize all this data in this uh, meta-analysis. Botman was the historical data, prospective registry, Fargo and Graffiti are the two randomized clinical trials available, limited number of patients each, and limited uh, number of limited follow-up available, and IMPAC registry is the second prospective registry available. The message that is conveyed uh, along all these four studies is that uh, uh, the risk of graft failure 
uh, in case the, um, uh, the native stenotic vessel has a preserved FFR is five times higher as compared to a graft that are anastomosed on vessels with a significant FFR. So the message we have seen in the registry is confirmed. And this is nicely depicted by this logistic regression model, where you see that the higher the FFR in the native coronary artery, the uh, higher the probability of graft failure at the latest available follow-up in this study, which is roughly uh, 12 to 24 months. Is this sufficient to say that to a higher patency rate, there is an improved clinical outcome? Of course not, for two main reasons. First, because the number of patients is limited all over. And secondly, the follow-up is limited. We saw in the observational data that it took us six years to see a difference there. And here we come to the end of my part. The higher the FFR value in the native vessel, the lower the patency rate of the graph. This is also coming from the observational registries and randomized clinical trials even if the clinical impact up to 24 months is limited, if any. Back to you, Bernard. Thank you very much, uh, Emanuele. We have only, uh, as you can expect, a few answers to your uh, three questions uh, to your poll. And again, I would like to remember, does functional assessment has any role, a role, if any, uh, during the heart team? And uh, there were three possibilities, no, uh, never. Um, or the, someti the surgeon sometimes asks for an FFR value and always, well, the vast majority is um, the second. Again, it's not a surprise. The surgeons sometimes ask for an FFR value during the heart team. Um, any reaction, Emanuele? Well, this is, I can tell you, already a major achievement because it means <laughs> that the, our surgical colleagues are starting to become more and more uh, aware of the importance of the functional stenosis severity, not just the angiographic stenosis severity. And I think it's our responsibility to provide evidences that this is the direction to go. That's my first reaction. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I would like to have one comment com concerning the heart team. I, it's, it's a general comment. <clears throat> I think we have to make all possible efforts as invasive cardiologists to provide the data during the heart team, not only as a number, but if possible, as a pressure tracing. And uh, this um, has a consequence is that we have to record these pressure tracings very carefully, that everyone, including cardiovascular surgeons, will understand immediately what's going on. And when you see a pressure tracing with a gradient of five millimeters of mercury and that you tell them that it corresponds to a fractional floor reserve of 0.92, they will always ask for a fractional floor reserve in the future. But if you only use numbers, this is very abstract. And if you don't um, have something more concrete, it will be difficult to introduce these kind of uh, discussions at the heart team. That's just a practical uh, comments, but the recording and the quality of the recording is really our responsibility. And we sh this should be done as well as an angiogram or as the recording of uh, an LD uh, pressure tracing or anything else. Yeah, besides, Any if, I can, um, if I can add a comment to that also, um, even that has now, uh, I think, a role in the heart team discussion, not only the, the value, but also the pattern of the disease, and now we have um, this information available with the pressure tracing and pullbacks, etc. And the, the presence of diffuse disease or more focal disease can also play a role in the discussion in the heart team. So I think, um, yeah. as you mentioned, that this, uh, the surgeons are getting more and more used to this. In the past, they really uh, didn't pay any attention at all to the functional significance of the lesions, and now they, uh, they ask for it sometimes. And also, this pattern of disease is, is going to be yeah. in the future one of the points of discussion in the heart team. Yeah, that's a very good comment, uh, Nieves. Um, well, I cannot agree more. And the, the pullback tracings, the, the, the so-called PPG, uh, all these quantification of the diffuseness of the disease versus the focality of the disease are important things and will prove to be more and more important in the future. That's absolutely sure. Um, I Well, in the sake, there are no, let's say, questions related to your topic, except one, maybe a very brief answer, Emanuele. Um, physiology, 
fractional floor reserve or NHPRs in in bypasses, not before bypasses, but in bypasses, the same uh, business as usual or uh, what? Well, uh, to be honest with you, we have even less data in that setting. And these yeah. data are retrospective registry. One is coming from our former uh, colleague, Luigi Di Serafino, who published a, a study on this. Um, you know, it, it matters a little bit more in arterial condits than in venous graft. Uh, you know, in arterial condits, you can anticipate that FFR is as reliable as in native coronary arteries. But please keep in mind there are some tips and tricks there. And one of these is that there is a natural resistance in the arterial grafts, irrespective from the uh, from uh, arteriosclerotic infiltration that does play a role. So in other words, the longer the arterial conduits, the higher the intrinsic resistance that you would find. And this intrinsic resistance should be subtracted from a possible finer FFR evaluation. But it's extremely difficult to explain this just in a short answer. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, in the sake of time, I would ask uh, Nicolas Minvaud uh, to switch to a completely different topic, uh, namely physiology in aortic stenosis in the area of TAVI. Nicolas, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, and uh, thank you for this uh, kind invitation to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, my topic today will be uh, uh, to focus on the role of fractional flow reserve in aortic stenosis patients and coronary artery disease who are candidates for a TAVI procedure. These are my, these are my disclosures. Uh, here is the outline of my uh, uh, presentation. I will first briefly introduce uh, uh, with the prevalence and impact of coronary artery disease in aortic stenosis patients, and will then look at the mechanism of myocardial ischemia in these patients, and of course, we'll uh, 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 focus on the role of a fractional flow reserve in aortic stenosis patients with coronary artery disease candidates for a TAVI procedure. Uh, the uh, uh, coronary artery disease is the most common comorbidity of uh, uh, aortic stenosis uh, patients and has an increasing prevalence with uh, age. The severity of coronary artery disease appears to be associated with uh, uh, impaired clinical outcomes in uh, patients undergoing TAVI. And uh, you can see that it I'm saying that in this cohort of uh, 450 patients with severe aortic stenosis undergoing uh, uh, TADI, those with a syntax score higher than 22 received less complete revascularization and had higher risk of cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke than patients without coronary artery disease or those with lower syntax uh, score. Now, several physiopathological mechanisms of myocardial ischemia in aortic stenosis uh, patients. And uh, uh, in, in, in the presence of uh, inadequate left ventricular hypertrophy, the wall stress is uh, uh, increased. And this leads to an increase in myocardial oxygen consumption and in extravascular compressive forces, resulting in coronary flow re reserve reduction. And in addition, because of LV hypertrophy, the capillary density is also reduced. So all of this mechanism, combining myocardial oxygen uh, demand increase, reduced extravascular compressive forces, and reduced capillary density, all of these uh, criteria will contribute to myocardial ischemia in aortic stenosis patients. In the presence of aortic stenosis, the systolic pressure time integral, uh, which is in red on the screen here, is uh, uh, the area under the left ventricular curve during the systole and is strongly correlated with myocardial oxygen demand. The diastolic pressure time integral, which is in green on the screen here, is the area between the aortic pressure and the left ventricular uh, pressure curves and is an estimate of the uh, coronary driving pressure and is correlated to uh, uh, the uh, uh, myocardial oxygen supply. In, uh, um, in the presence of aortic stenosis, the DPTI to SPTI ratio, which is the uh, ratio of the supply to uh, uh, demand uh, uh, myocardial oxygen, this ratio 
will uh, um, severely decreased because the SPTI will increase while the rising left ventricular and diastolic pressure will decrease. And uh, uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, it's not. And this, uh, uh, this is responsible for uh, uh, um, a strongly decrease in the, in the DPTI to SPTI ratio. In the presence of uh, aortic uh, stenosis, the diastolic pressure time integral is the area between the distal coronary pressure and the left ventricular pressure curve during diastole, which is the blue band over here on the right. And in this example, uh, you can see that the uh, the patient uh, under one coronary evaluation before TAVI, he had instant right coronary artery with stenosis, and three pressures were measured simultaneously, namely aortic pressure via the guiding catheter, then the coronary pressure via the distal wire, and the left ventricular pressure via the pitel catheter. The fractional flow reserve was 0.54, and the mean aortic gradient was 51 millimeter of mercury. And you can see that in the absence of both aortic stenosis and coronary artery stenosis, the supply to demand ratio would be 0.95 near the normal value. Then in the presence of aortic stenosis without any coronary stenosis, the supply to demand ratio would be decreased to 0.66. And in the presence of both aortic stenosis and significant coronary stenosis, then you can see that the uh, uh, supply to demand ratio would be as low as 0.16, uh, illustrating the additive effect of the tandem aortic valve and coronary stenosis in, in the uh, 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 decrease in this uh, uh, supply to demand uh, ratio. So uh, now I will focus on the role of fractional flow reserve in aortic stenosis patient. And the first question is, is it safe to give IV or intracoronary adenosine in elderly patients with severe aortic stenosis? And the answer is yes, it is safe. IV adenosine is safe and well tolerated for fractional flow reserve assessment in these uh, patients. Clearly, it is associated with a significantly greater drop in uh, systolic, diastolic, and mean arterial pressures as compared with baseline value, but it's not associated with any clinically significant adverse uh, event. How reliable is fractional flow reserve in aortic stenosis patients? In other words, can we trust this fractional flow reserve value, uh, clearly, which is uh, uh, FFR of 0.82 uh, measured in the left anterior descending of this old lady with a severe aortic stenosis and preserve the left ventricular ejection fraction and uh, with angiographically intermediate stenosis of the mid left anterior descending artery. There is a complex interplay between the severity of aortic stenosis, the elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressures, the LV hypertrophy, and the associated negative remodeling of the coronary microcirculation. And this, let's say, may uh, blunt the response to adenosine and consequently the achievement of maximal hyperemia. And uh, uh, these factors can theoretically reduce the reliability of fractional flow reserve in aortic stenosis patients because of possible underestimation of the ischemic significance of a coronary lesion. In very severe aortic stenosis, there is uh, an, an increase in the resting carotid blood flow. The peak hyperemic flow is decreased, and this leads to a significant reduction in the delta between hyperemic and baseline resting flow. But uh, uh, these, uh, this does not call into question the measurement of fractional flow reserve, which is the ratio of a hyperemic flow in the presence of a stenosis to the hyperemic flow in the hypothetical absence of the stenosis. And therefore, whatever the condition, the hyperemic ratio of mean distal pressure to mean aortic pressure is an accurate reflection of stenosis uh, significant and it corresponds to the definition of fractional flow reserve, and therefore confirming that the fractional flow reserve value is reliable in patients with uh, severe aortic uh, stenosis. This is an example of a 
a situation where I think the fractional flow reserve measurement may be important. The FFR measured in the LED artery of these patients with a severe aortic stenosis and preserved the left ventricular ejection fraction was 0.82, confirming that the osteo lesion of the LED was not significant. And I think that using fractional flow reserve in proximal and geographically intermediate lesions with an extensive underlying myocardial territory is probably clinically relevant. Well, uh, if fractional flow reserve is a re reliable in aortic stenosis patient, then it uh, uh, should not vary significantly after TAVI. And indeed, uh, uh, only minor variations of coronary physiology indices are observed either immediately after TAVI procedure or uh, during follow-up after the uh, procedure. And as you can see here in this exploratory study, a uh, uh, high FFR demonstrated a higher reclassification rate at follow-up compared with FFR, while uh, FFR decreased in very few lesions with abnormal baseline value, while it remained stable in all of the lesions with an FFR greater than 0.80. So the threshold value, the usual threshold value of fractional flow reserve or EFR is still valid in our tip stenosis uh, patients. Uh, do we know the FFR guide, the impact of FFR guided coronary revascularization in patients uh, undergoing uh, JAVI? Well, uh, in, we, we have only very few retrospective observational data available. And in this uh, matched comparison from a small uh, cohort study of aortic stenosis patients, we can see that fractional flow reserve uh, clearly, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, in, um, in, impact uh, the, the, the prognosis of uh, uh, patients. It, it, it makes it possible to downgrade the number of diseased vessels when compared with coronary angiography alone without increasing the adverse even rates. And in this uh, other uh, retrospective observational uh, study of patients undergoing TAVI, fractional flow reserve guided revascularization was associated with an improved event free survival at 24 months when compared with angiography guided revascularization. There are several ongoing prospective trials that will uh, hopefully fill the gap in, in available evidence on the clinical outcomes of fractional flow reserve in, in patients undergoing JAVI. Very briefly, this is a patient with uh, aortic stenosis referred for a TAVI procedure and complaining with uh, uh, severe dyspnea. The coronary angiography showed intermediate stenosis of the mid left anterior descending and intermediate stenosis of the mid right coronary artery. The fractional flow reserve was 0.75 in the LAD and 0.84 in the right coronary artery. And taking into account the extensive underlying myocardial territory of the uh, proximal LAD, the lesion was dilated and stented before TAVI. The right coronary artery was not approached, and the TAVI procedure was subsequently performed without any uh, problem. And this, in this uh, last uh, uh, case, Uh, in this very last case, the uh, patient had a severe renal failure and impaired left ventricular injection fraction. The coronary angiography showed an intermediate stenosis of the distal left circumflex with diffuse disease of the LED and right coronary artery. Again, taking into account the relatively small myocardial territory of the distal surf, this lesion was not approached and uh, the patient was given the medical treatment and uh, uh, the TAVI procedure was performed uh, subsequently without any uh, problem. To conclude, uh, to conclude, please keep in mind that uh, coronary artery disease has a very high prevalence in patients uh, uh, undergoing TAVI and that in this setting, fractional flow reserve is feasible, safe and reliable with very minor uh, variation of coronary physiology indices following the TAVI procedure, which means that we have to use the same threshold values as in non-aortic stenosis patients. 
Finally, what about the fractional flow reserve guiding revascularization in these patients? Only few retrospective data are available to assess the impact of this uh, uh, strategy. However, results of uh, ongoing prospective trials are expected that will fill the gap in available evidence and should give us some uh, convincing answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for this uh, good summary of the physiology and then the practicalities of uh, coronary, physi coronary physiology applied to patients with aortic stenosis in the area of TAVI. Now, in the chat box, there, there, there is uh, one question which, which com comes back three times, so we will not uh, escape to the question. It is not immediately related to coronary physiology, but since we have three superb TAVI operators here, the question is, do we, let's say, in which patient do we really have to revascularize before TAVI or in the context of TAVI? But let's say before TAVI, it's each time written before TAVI. In which patients? Is, is it, for example, in the patient that, for example, in the patient that you had with a, an old lady with an 0.75, which doesn't look um, let's say, very unstable in the LAD, is it needed or not to revascularize? I would say that uh, symptomatic patients with angina, for example, those with uh, a proximal lesion corresponding to a large underlying myocardial artery, I mean, a large extent of myocardium at risk, of course, patients without any contraindication to dual antiplatelet therapy, this is a point that needs to be uh, taken into account Maybe those with a low syntax score, but this point needs to be uh, clarified. I think all of these patients are potentially good candidates for revascularization and therefore for fractional flow reserve assessment. And on the contrary, asymptomatic patients, those with distal or diffuse and complex lesions, I, I think those, of course, contraindicated to uh, dual antiplatelet therapy are probably poor candidates for revascularization and therefore for FFR measurements. Now the question of should we uh, 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 revascularize the, the patient before on, on, on after TAVI, uh, I mean, we need data because we have a recent meta-analysis uh, showing that PCI pre-TAVI was not associated with uh, any increase in one-year mortality. And uh, curiously, these results have generally been interpreted as a proof of the feasibility and the safety of PCI in this context, which is pure speculation, pure extrapolation. I think that staging the PCI and TAVI procedure remains the most common strategy. And uh, when a PCI is, indication is, is established, it's usually performed upstream of TAVI. I don't know what's the experience of the other uh, uh, yeah. um, colleagues, but uh, uh, but we have to keep in mind that stage procedures are potentially associated with uh, additional vascular puncture, repeat injection of contrast media, and and and, uh, and, and well, it, this, these points need to be taken into account as well. But, but the optimal timing of uh, a PCI prior to view remains uh, unclear. A brief comment, Nieves. Or... Yeah, um, I fully agree. I think um, that also, uh, I mean, the age of the patient and the possibility of uh, disease progression, also which kind of TAVI are we going to implant and which kind of access are we going to have in the future to this coronary is another point to take into account in the decision. And especially the complexity of the lesion uh, when we're treating old patients, fragile patients, um, in our center, for example, we try not to embark in very complex uh, PCI in these uh, patients if they are not uh, symptomatic for angina. Uh, we believe the, um, the aortic stenosis is the main uh, corporate of the, of the symptoms of the patient. Emmanuel, anything? But very better? quickly, with the, with the gaining experience, both with self-expandable and balloon-expandable TAVI, it's quite easy to gain access to the coronary ostia. Uh, this was more of an issue before when we didn't know whether it was safe to cross to the struts of the self-expanding valve uh, and gain access to the coronary ostia. There is no issue anymore nowadays. 
number one. Number two, I would just use in the absence of solid data indicating what is the best strategy, really try to follow the, the predominant symptoms. I know in a, in a complex patient like an aortic stenosis patient with CAD associated is not always easy, but let's say if angina is the predominant symptom, I would go for PCI first. If dyspnea is the predominant symptom or syncope, I would go for TAVI first. But there, that's a rule of thumb. There is no clear data on that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's move to a next uh, complicated, I was about to say a little bit annoying problem of about physiology and coronary artery disease, uh, near this left main and fractional flow reserve. Yeah, thank you, um, Bernard. Um, so let's focus, yes, on the use of uh, physiology in the left main. Um, I'm going to start the presentation with um, a case of uh, everyday practice. Um, you can see here uh, this, uh, sorry about that. Let's see if we can see the videos moving. Yeah, there, there we are. You can see two projections. This is a patient that was submitted for heart failure in the context of atrial fibrillation. The patient had a previous anterior MI. Um, and he had a very mild troponin elevation during this admission, so he was uh, sent uh, for this angiogram. And you can see already that there is uh, a lesion in the left main that is visible on the uh, cranial view on the left. It's around 50% stenosis caused by a very calcified plaque at this, at this level. It's almost no visible in the caudal view on the right, so it's a very eccentric lesion. Here you have some still images demonstrating again this lesion uh, in the left main, this intermediate lesion, we would say. And of course, the question here is, is this left main uh, lesion uh, severe? And um, for me, the answer is uh, it's almost impossible to say that uh, using only angiography. Um, in this case, we uh, assess um, this lesion using physiology, and you can see the IFR values with the wire positioned in the LED on the left and uh, on the CERC on the right, you can see that the IFR values were normal. So this left main lesion that on one of the views looks like 50% uh, stenosis of the left main was really um, not significant and did not have any uh, functional impact uh, on the patient. So um, why is uh, um, using physiology important to assess left main stenosis? Well, the main uh, problem we have uh, in the left main is that angiography, angiography has a lot of limitations, even more than in other parts of the coronary tree, because uh, it's a region where we sometimes have very uh, important angulations. We have the basal tapering. We have also significant foreshortening. We can have um, a, a lot of overlapping on all of other vessels. We can have sometimes diffuse disease and, and therefore a lack of a good reference to really uh, assess the severity of the lesion. Also, the reflux of the contrast in the aortic sinus can be a problem. And of course, also the problem of the sustained myocardium. This uh, example we just saw, for example, is in a patient that had a previous anterior MI. And of course, this impact, uh, the result of the, of the functional impact of this, of this lesion. So um, with all these uh, limitations of angiography, this is why um, physiology can be important. There have been uh, several studies demonstrating how really it's very difficult to understand only with angiography how severe a left main lesion is. This is one study demonstrating um, that really the visual assessment of the left main, there is a lot of vari variation between reviewers. And as you can see in this study, um, in many of the situations, uh, the uh, functional impact of the left main was misclassified by the reviewers. There were lots of cases where the lesion uh, was not significant and was um, by visual assessment considered severe and the other way around. So really visual assessment is not very reliable in the left main. And if we try to use uh, quantitative coronary angiography to try to make it a little bit more objective, again, we can see that there is some correlation on the left you can see the correlation of diameter stenosis and FFR. There is a correlation that is significant, but it's very low. You can see there a very low R value. Uh, and also on the right, similar data with IFR, you can see a big dispersion of the IFR values in relation with the percentage diameter of stenosis by QCA. So really, geography is limited in this regard. What about the other technique we have for the main uh, evaluation, which is IBUS? 
Well, this is a table summarizing uh, some of the most important studies trying to understand whether IBOS can be a good tool to understand uh, whether a lesion in the left main is severe. And the first thing you can notice is that there is a wide dispersion on the cutoff values proposed. You can see that they range from 4.5 to 8. So uh, this clearly indicates that there is not a clear cutoff. Um, besides, um, there are many factors influencing the significance of the lesion, such as the body mass index, the percentage area stenosis. So it's, um, it's difficult that only with an area in one cross section, we can predict the functional impact of the stenosis. Besides, there are some technical problems of fibers that you may all know, such as, for example, the presence of calcification or the presence of severe angulation that really makes it very difficult to understand the real area of uh, the uh, lumen of the left main in some cross sections, um, given the eccentricity of the, of the catheter. So with all this um, into account, with all these limitations of angiography and also some limitations of fibers, uh, that's why physiology can be maybe a more objective um, tool to evaluate the severity of left main lesions, um, because it will give us a direct reflection of the uh, impact of this stenosis on the coronary hemodynamics. Uh, I have to say, and as Bernard mentioned before, there is some evidence um, that is, um, I would say, um, not very strong, but uh, there are few studies that are all of them very concordant. So there is some evidence uh, about uh, the use of physiology in, in left main. And this is uh, probably the most important one uh, with uh, FFR that was published already quite some years ago. Um, this is a study that included uh, 200, uh, uh, 213 patients. Um, you can see here that the patients, uh, this is a prospective cohort study, the patients were divided um, and were treated depending on the FFR. So patients that had a normal FFR were deferred. So patients with an FFR above 0.8 were deferred. Patients with an FFR below 0.8 were treated. And in this case, they were all treated with uh, cabbage. And you can see here in these uh, couple of major curves that there were no difference between the groups in terms of survival or global maze. This is a summary of all the prospective cohort studies uh, evaluating this uh, issue of uh, using uh, physiology to understand the severity of left main. You can see that in general, it's true that uh, most of the studies are small uh, in the sample size. Um, you can also see that the FFR cutoff that was used in general was 0.75, and only in this uh, last study that I just showed you, it was 0.80. Um, you can see also that the deferral rate in all the studies was around 50%, and you can already see that the survival rate in deferred patients is very good. So it really, uh, this data shows that deferring uh, a left main lesion when the FFR is uh, above the cutoff is safe. The survival rates for the patients uh, in these groups are uh, was really excellent. This uh, is the meta-analysis summarizing all these uh, studies, and you can see again that there are no differences in maze mortality or MI between patients with abnormal FFR that were prevascularized and patients with normal FFR that were deferred. So it was safe to defer these patients if the FFR normal, if the FFR value was normal. There was a trend uh, that was actually a significant difference in revascularizations in patients that were deferred. But it's also true that in this meta-analysis, it's not specified whether these were revascularizations of the left main or uh, were revascularizations of other vessels. So it's not TLR, but global revascularizations. And uh, taking into account that there are no differences in mortality, probably most of the revascularizations were not related with the left main. What about IFR or resting indices? Well, we have this study, the defined left main, that evaluated um, the use of IFR in left main, 300 patients included. Again, patients with normal IFR above 0.89 were deferred, while patients with uh, abnormal IFR were treated, in this case with cabbage or PCI, and it was around half of the patients with uh, each treatment modality. And this is, uh, on the, you can see there, the primary endpoint that was a composite of death, MI, and TLR 
And again, no differences between patients with normal IFR that were declared are patients with an abnormal IFR that were treated. No differences also in the individual components of the um, primary endpoint. So um, what are the potential pitfalls? Once we have seen the evidence, what are the potential pitfalls and problems of the physiological assessment of left main stenosis? Well, the first one, uh, of course, is uh, that the engagement of the guiding catheter in the uh, left main when you have an stenosis may cause pressure damping. And this can generate uh, values of FFR that are not correct. Um, and damping uh, is especially relevant when we have osteo lesions. So we really need to make sure that we have the catheter disengaged when we are performing um, a physiological assessment in these types uh, of lesions. Um, of course, uh, also the use of intracoronary uh, adenosine may be complex, especially we need to disengage the catheter. So of course, it's recommended to use intravenous adenosine. Um, apart from this technical aspect of the damping of the pressure, the main problem we have when uh, evaluating the left main using physiology is the presence of downstream stenosis. We all know that it's very rare to have an isolated left main lesion uh, very frequently, we have um, another lesions in the coronary tree, and um, the FFR value of the left main can be influenced by uh, these uh, lesions, and the severity of the left main lesion can be underestimated when you have distal lesions in the other vessels. How much uh, does um, a distal lesion influence the um, FFR value that you obtain for uh, the left main? Well, it depends on how much is this distal stenosis decreasing the flow across the left main. And this is influenced by two aspects. First of all, the severity of the lesion and also uh, the amount of myocardium that is uh, subtended by uh, the left main. Uh, you can see here two drawings demonstrating uh, in A and B, you can see that there is a lesion in the left main. When you add a lesion in the LAD, uh, you can see that this, this uh, can make the FFR value for the left main go up. So uh, this can give an underestimation of the real FFR value of the left main. On the two panels in C and D, you, see, you can see an example of a patient that has an occlusion of the right coronary artery. So you can see that the territory irrigated by the left main is basically all the myocardium. Once you, uh, so then the FFR value here is uh, significant. Once you open the right, then the territory decreases and this left main lesion becomes uh, non-significant. So all these aspects are very relevant and very important to be taken into account when you are evaluating this uh, type of lesions. How can we uh, overcome this problem of the downstream stenosis? Um, well, uh, one of the options is uh, putting the wire in the non-disease vessel. For example, if we have a lesion in the LED, you can think, I'm gonna put the wire in the cerc and measure the lesion in the left main. It's very important to understand that having a lesion in the LED, if this lesion is uh, severe, this can influence the value that you get um, putting the wire in the circ. So this is very relevant um, and um, is not valid. Therefore, if you have a proximal severe stenosis in the LED to uh, try to obtain the FFR value of the left main, just putting the wire in the cert. This is uh, very relevant. Um, the other option, of course, to try to uh, overcome the problem of um, uh, distal stenosis is uh, using pressure pullbacks. This is an example of a patient where you can see there is a distal lesion in the left main, and then there is a lot of the disease also in the LED and FFR. A value of 0.76 was obtained, so really significant lesion. The patient uh, was submitted to PCI due to other comorbidities. And in this case, um, the operators decided to do a, a pullback, in this case using IFR, using resting in this. And you can see that most of the pressure loss is located actually in the LAD. And once we reach uh, the left main lesion, um, the IFR there is almost normal. So distal to the left main, the IFR value was 0.93. So it was really normal value at this level. Um, so based on that, the operators in this case decided to treat the LED. 
And this is the FFR value obtained once the uh, LED was treated. You can see that the FFR value now is normal. So really this lesion in the left main was not significant and did not require treatment. Uh, this is another example showing uh, the same, a very tight distal lesion in the LED and also some um, degree of stenosis in the left main that we don't know if it's really important or not. With this pressure pullback, you can see again that uh, the lesion in the um, left main is significant. Once you are with a wire distal to the left main lesion, still the IFR value was very low, 0.5. So really a lot of uh, pressure loss at the level of the left main. This lesion was significant and required treatment um, as uh, a different case as compared with the previous one. So um, finally, we can, of course, try to correlate all these um, physiological measurements with uh, angiography and even predict what would be the, the value that we could obtain treating one lesion to isolate the left main, like in this case, for example, if we would treat the LAD lesion, then um, the, F, the IFR value in this case that we could obtain, it would be still significant, 0.85, so this left main lesion should be uh, treated still significant. So in summary, angiographic evaluation of the left main um, is uh, uh, difficult, has limitations. Uh, physiology provides a more objective assessment. There is some evidence that is limited supporting the safety of uh, the physiological evaluation. It's limited, but I have to say it's all very um, coherent, let's say, or um, in all the studies, the results are um, uh, indicating that this is safe. And finally, the main problem is downstream stenosis. Um, this is a context where, of course, evaluating globally the patient, the symptoms, the pattern of the disease, and the potential influence of each lesion is uh, very relevant to decide about the treatment options. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nieves, for this uh, quick review. We have couple of minutes left for a short discussion before the wrap-up. Um, there is one question. Um, well, it relates to the involvement of the LED. You, you explained that very well. I will simply repeat. When there is a tight lesion in the LED, measuring the lesion, measuring the severity of the left main by putting the wire in the circumflex, just as you explained, is tricky. So we have to keep into account the fact that the lesion in the LED might influence also the FFR value measured in the, in the circumflex. But this is only when the lesion is really tight. So when you do a pullback and you have a big jump of uh, 40 millimeters of mercury, yes, this lesion will hide, will conceal the uh, severity of the left main as you illustrated in your second left main cases. There was a nice pullback. Are there any other burning questions from the other members of the panel? I had a short question, a technical question from the chat box. The equalization is very often, a, let's say, puzzling. And when we have a little bit of wedging, people very often, and that was the question, do we have to disengage the guiding from the left main to equalize? I don't know what you do, uh, Nieves, but... Uh... Yeah, we do. One thing you can do is just yeah. you know, about a wire to um, disengage the catheter and do the equalization outside them. Yeah. Otherwise, um, make sure uh, that we are done without pressure. Yeah. I think it is, this is good clinical practice to do so, but I would like just to add that if this wedging is just a small ventricularization, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can equalize at this position. And uh, because sometimes it's tricky to remove the yeah. guiding in the left main when you are wedged and you have already crossed the lesion with the wire. So you can equalize with a moderate ventricularization. The only trick, the only purpose of the equalization is to have both systems speaking the same language. So that's a, that's a, a small detail which was uh, uh, questioned several times in the chat. I think that in the sake of time, uh, we have to conclude, and I, I even believe I won't have the time to have the wrap-up. You summarized all these things very, very well. So, um, well, I see that the slides are popping up for the wrap-up. Maybe you can uh, go one slide further, please. Could you do it yourself? Okay, we are dealing... Next slide. Next. Next. Okay. 
So uh, wrapping up for the CABG, I think that the higher the fractional flow value in the native vessel, the lower patency rate, that's absolutely clear. And the clinical impact of FFR guidance is actually relatively limited in terms of death and MI, but is associated with a more simple intervention. Next slide, please. FFR in aortic stenosis, to keep it very simple, and I will stick to this point, I think we have for the moment to rem remember this fractional flow reserve and physiology in aortic stenosis. It's almost business as usual. Same cutoff, sa same decision trees, except that these patients are older, fragile, and all these things. We have to keep this in mind and use clinical sense, of course. And finally, next slide. Um, in the left main, I think that we have no randomized data, but there is a lot of experience, and each center has its own experience indicate that it is even useful to decide about the needs of revascularization in left main lesions. But this evidence is, of course, relatively elusive. Now, I would like to close this webinar here, thanking all three of you for these excellent summaries. We are running a little bit late of time. I apologize for the audience. Thank you for your participation, for your several questions, and I apologize for all the questions we could not uh, answer. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.